And we are back, everyone. Thanks for sticking around while we were on break. And now, uh, we are here with our very own death lorist, Caitlin Kinney. But Daisy, Daisy, you have a question right off the bat, right? I do. Um, so this is the part where we interview the guests that we have on the show. And we're so lucky to have Caitlin here because uh, we're friends and we talk, but not enough about the stuff that like intersects with our own research, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I'm going to. You got a banger right off the top. You got a banger right yeah. off the top. So I so I got a question for you here. Um, so I I don't consider myself a, a the person who studies death, but I do study extinction, which is not unlike studying death in a number of different ways. Um, and I'm curious, as a folklorist who does study death and markets himself as a death a person who studies death and folklore uh, as intersections of research. <laughs> What can, how would a folklorist who studies death approach death at different scales? So scales being like extinction, which is something that I look at that's a really broad group. Um, it involves many, many, many individuals dying. It involves like these global kind of conversations around climate change. Um, or we can think of like pandemics would be another kind of large scale all the way mm -hmm. down to like, family relationships like when your sibling or your your grandparent or somebody close to you die, or best friend dies mm -hmm. how might a folklorist a death lorist approach those different areas does that make sense yeah okay so that makes sense um actually like i've had a few thoughts about like your extinction work as death work because like in my mind like it is um yeah because you're dealing with loss and a certain type of trauma it's just like on a much different scale like you were saying before so, like when we're dealing with death on like smaller scales like in our everyday lives like losing someone like co-worker a friend a family member even a pet like you're, you're like losing that whole like webs of significance thing and how we build those webs of significance in our everyday lives like when you lose somebody that that thread is still in existence but that person or animal is no longer there so you have all of these like memories and experiences that are um still living but the tangible object itself is like gone um and like i guess like thinking about like how we communicate and process and deal with that in our everyday lives um it can it can apply like a lot broader um so like you have like things like land loss so like one of there's like an interesting thing with like um at least in like agricultural communities. Um, there's been like a rise in um, farmer suicide, which has been like pretty well noted and documented within like the past five years or so because a lot of land being like like familial land that goes back generations being bought up um, is like triggering like this sense of like loss that's like so complete that like they feel like they can't go on then like you have things like extinction which is like like your thylacine like there's community of people that have like it's like strong like connections that they're feeling to this animal that they've never known in their lifetime because like the last thylacine died like in the 30s correct yes mm -hmm wrong mm -hmm. no yeah you're right okay, cool 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 yeah so like while they might not have like any living memory of the thylacine there might be stories like, within their families about the thylacine maybe that's why they're like making this sort of connections so it's like that tie that like thing that's haunting is um still like making that connection i have no idea if like what i'm saying is making sense but like i I think I I think I get what you're saying like there's like the it's interesting to think about the embodiment of death or how we impose yes, like, there we go. 
yeah like death not even necessarily that like we're personally but like, embodying but like the putting death into something physical um or like the spirit of the person or some kind of yeah like the like, loss the grief itself. takes a shape yeah so like grief itself is it's like an embodied experience mm -hmm. um because like you're still feeling all of that connection but like it's also like a weird like disembodied thing too um Bubbly like soda in the chat says that those intangibles uh, they would call intimacies um, because we all the work is about intimacy, which is great. Yeah, um, yeah. Surely you can't be says personification of death and and grief, right? Like psychopomps. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and I, it's very interesting this question of scale for I think us as folk because. Part of the identity of a lot of folklorists is to focus on the micro scale, to to have the interpersonal, mm -hmm. like intimate, uh, to use Chrissy's word, um, interactions between each other on an everyday basis. But when you apply it to something like a pandemic or like huge mass scale, I mean, any any kind of like large scale large collective collective like, experience yeah. or action, I think that. Uh, I guess like ha maybe we could figure this together. Like the folklorist role is to to translate how that systemic or that large scale experience happens in an actionable micro ways, right? Is that mm -hmm. would you say that that's true, or how does that look like when you talk to your communities about death? Because they're like, I'm thinking of large scale. Or like maybe larger or more impactful events like true crime, for example. Um, mm -hmm. True crime has like when it, when a tragic, horrible crime happens and ripples through a community, like that's a bigger scale than like if somebody dies just like in a smaller family. How, as a folklorist, do you approach the like that kind of question? Well, for me, it's like how it's being communicated. So like a lot more comfortable talking about those large scale things because like is that something that could happen to us possibly likely probably not um so like it's easier for people to engage in that sort of like communication and like collective action i think than like um dealing with like individual or um like close ties um like their personal community can so i can i lead this legends. into can i lead this into uh, <laughs> yeah. can i lead this into uh, one of your questions uh, the sleuths root because uh, wrote sleuths root one of the questions the sleuths <laughs> wrote because i think it's the perfect transition <laughs> hmm? all right and once again like i always say thank the sleuths the people who write these questions but okay um when do we, and I guess we being people, get hands on about death, and when do we get hands off about death? Ooh, ooh, that is that's a really good question. Tough one. And like honestly, that's gonna vary like person to person, mm. based on their own like comfortableness dealing with death. Um. That's really tough. Um, I, I do feel like people are, um, when big things happen, they feel more comfortable coming together to do collective action. They're like thinking about 9 11 and like the um, like spontaneous memorials that were popping up like around the Pentagon and um, in New York as well. And then. Um, you see those sort of smaller like collective actions of like like spontaneous memorials in general are just like a good example of like roadside memorials and ghost bikes and that sort of thing mm -hmm. um because those dark places where terrible things happened um they mark places where abnormal death happens and by abnormal i mean like it's not the medical deterioration of a body so it's things like an accident or murder a natural disaster, uh, 
non-natural disaster. Um, I feel like people are more comfortable coming together for those sorts of things than like maybe like somebody passing. You do have things like wakes and people bring you food, and then you have like after funeral gathering um reception thing but it's going to vary person to person and community to community um it's all based on how comfortable they are with death i have another question i don't know what go, the, for, it. go for it daisy yeah okay so this is because you mentioned memorialization mm -hmm. Um, and there's also a question in the chat that pertains to this too. So I will, I'll bring it back to that. Um, but I, I'm thinking of like the hands on hands off part in terms of memorialization, a lot of times what people do is put physical objects or what folklorists call like material culture as a component mm -hmm. of that memorialization. Um, I guess what is... Expl can you help explain further like some of these more material aspects of how we remember and memorialize death in in the culture of the United States, for example? That might even be too broad, but uh, I wanted to give you less space to clarify thinking about that because you mentioned stuff like ghost bikes, and I'm not always sure that like the chat under like knows about yeah. some of this stuff that that you might so, study. Yeah, so ghost bikes are um, typically that sometimes get painted and they're like chained to um like a street sign or somewhere on like a side of a road where a biker has been basically hit by a car and died um which is a super tragic accident so even like walking by that and seeing that bike like within that community um people know like Maybe this is, it communicates, A, somebody died there. B, it might be a dangerous spot. <laughs> um, because, like, we all know some roads are more dangerous to bike on than others. Um, it, it's communicating certain things that that community feels needs to be communicated. It's also communicating, like, this is the lo a loss of life happened here. Um, you have like other interesting like spontaneous memorials. I don't know if you guys have seen like things that have like circulated on like Instagram or Facebook or Twitter where like somebody will that, see like that goes that, into Bobby like Soda's question, which is all about mm -hmm. the online version of the memorialization. And that was gonna be my follow up is like, what about this more ephemeral or like movement, mm -hmm. the things that move and go in and out of fashion quickly for memorialization? Yeah, so um, I I was going to talk about like uh, I was going to use like city pigeons. Like sometimes when people find like dead animals like, on the side of a sidewalk or or a, a road, they might sometimes start leaving things there to like memorialize the animal that builds up. So that was like something that was circulating. But to speak more about like online memorialization you see it all over the place um so like facebook when you when people pass will just automatically kind of like archive your page but still make it like people are able to engage with it um and like people will post and leave messages um robert dobler from i think he's currently at iu has written about uh early like um, forms of online memorialization via MySpace. Um, some people are really for them because it provides like cool thing about the internet death is that it provides this liminal space for you to like engage with it safely. Um, provides that like social distance um like you don't have to talk to the family you can just write a sweet message on the wall like talking about your friend and maybe that will mean something to them but it means something to you that you're leaving it there um, um yeah 
No, that was great. Um, yeah. Dom, I need to alert your attention to the raccoon memorial. I um, loved the raccoon that? memorial. The raccoon memorial was That's... so funny. I loved that so much. Yeah, the the number one Toronto, I believe, has the most raccoons of any city in the world. And then this was a wow. a raccoon who died and was like left on the sidewalk. And like the like the official response from the city, like animal control, was taking too long. And so like, yeah, they they uh, <laughs> they uh surrounded the raccoon with things the raccoon might might want. It was uh, I I thought it was so funny. I loved it so much. Um, I. I've got a bajillion chat questions, but should, also should I know we... there's, there's good curated questions. So let's go with those first. We yeah. Can yeah. Them. Chat, you've been on fire. That's great. Yeah. Uh, chat, you're doing great if you, tonight. Yeah. If we'll you're circle... sending any questions, I'm putting them on a list. So yeah. We'll circle back to them. We'll circle back to yeah. them uh, later. But yeah, keep it up, but... chat. Good work. Good work uh, to our 131 followers. Oh, we hit a thousand views tonight, by the way. But. Oh, shit. Pretty cool. Um, okay. <laughs> we talked cool. about True Crime Podcast a little bit earlier. Caitlin, um, how are true crime podcasts the digital media version of the Singing Bone? Oh man, oh man. Okay, so I, I uh, have a very long commute. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts and have for years. And something that started to happen was me thinking about dead bodies and official versus well institutional versus non-institutional ways that we communicate about those dead bodies Mm -hmm. podcasts so um okay so this is going to kind of tie into like medicalization rant so the advancement of science, like, it's just drastically altered the way that um, we think about dead things. We think about what? Um, I think we lost you. Dead things. And dead things. Like, oh, uh, it just, yeah, so it drastically alters the way that we, we think and conceptualize uh, dying and dead bodies. So alongside, like, advancement of like you know medical things that keep us alive longer there's also the advancement of forensic science you have like happening alongside it because the more that you find out about like living in the dead like just natural progression um so how we started talking about like the dead started becoming very like institutionalized and it like that language is owned by like medical professionals. Um, and um, the bodies themselves kind of like all they're being like objectified as just dead bodies to figure out like what happened to them, like say after a murder um, the bodies themselves are speaking about what happened to them via like forensic science. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and so, like, for people whole... who don't, and for people who don't know, what is the singing bone? Cause I feel like this is where you bring that up. I got this. I okay. got this. Okay. So the singing bone, it's ATU 780. The truth comes to light. Um, and like the whole, whole thing about the singing bone, um, there, there's like more like, motif things that go into it but essentially what happens is that there's somebody who is unjustly murdered body is hidden um it's normally like near like some sort of like body of water or some type of deal and then like somebody like a bard or um like a uh shepherd finds the body and then proceeds to use like the bones or the hair to make things like mouthpieces uh, for horns or like violins out of like the breastbone and finger pegs. <laughs> um, pegs out of like the finger bones and like string up violin with the hair. And then when you play the instrument, the only thing that the instrument can play, like sing, is like how it died. Mm. So eventually, 
like word gets around the community that like so and so has this magical instrument and eventually the truth is brought to light and like the killer is brought to justice um just like fascinates me it's like my favorite every folklorist has their favorite atu yeah and that is like my absolute favorite one and this is honestly just gonna make me sound like i was a super creepy kid but like i read grimms in middle school because like was that kid and i checked out that book from the library and it was like that mm-hmm. thick mm-hmm. um that was my favorite folk tale out of that one um makes me sound like a creepy kid it, no um, it just makes you sound like someone who's into true crime podcasts as an adult <laughs> into the truth coming to life yeah yeah well i did watch true crime stuff then too so um yeah so this is kind of like where like what's happening in that like folk tale is that like body is being like objectified, but in that objectification, um truth comes to light. And the cool thing yeah. about podcasts is how even like deeper truth is kind of coming to light because podcasts aren't bound by like institutionalized like, like rules mm-hmm. um like they're reading police reports and yes they're talking about police reports and yes they're engaging with mainstream media but they're also talking to families and friends and like rehumanizing the dead that have been objectified in like the process of like finally being able to like speak it's just like it's just I think it's just very exciting makes me nerd out so um, you're setting yourself up actually for the next question which is uh, you, you, you said uh uh, like reconnecting with the dead, but how is listening to true crime podcasts kind of like uh, reconnecting with death? Um, I really like true crime podcasts because I do think it provides a way with us to like begin to engage with like our own death anxieties, um, mm. just anxiety in general. So like a large portion of like true crime podcast listeners are like women. I think women do have like a lot of death anxiety because from the time that we're like very small children, we're told like, keep your eyes out when you're walking through a parking lot. Mm -hmm. If you're walking alone at night, walk with your keys in between your knuckles. Like stranger danger is just pounded into us super, super young. Um, And it provides like a way for us to like engage with those anxieties. I, I know a lot of people don't like true crime because of like it is very like anxiety inducing and a lot of people that listen to true crime do have to take breaks because like it does do that sometimes but it do- also provides a space for us to engage with those anxieties and think about them uh can I still go back to folk tales real quick because you mentioned what sure. would you say uh, uh your favorite one is ATU would you say it was 170? 780. 780. ATU 780. Okay. ATU 780. Um, speaking of folktales, you have uh, written at least one novel that is a coming of age story based on Native American folktales. Do you have any other novels that you're hiding from us? Um, so I never finished that novel because I started grad school. Okay. okay. Uh, but it exists in yes? some state, in some state somewhere does and yes I, I do have other novels that i am hiding dom i have any um because i was a very nerdy middle schooler high schooler and i did things like i by myself yeah because i lived in rural Virginia. 
I was I, I I guess the real question is how many times have you done uh ne uh Nanorama? I think like uh, I think it was like I did it twice in high school okay. and I think probably two and a half times in college, like undergrad. I uh, it was good. I think the chat two has... and a half times is way more than I've done Nanorama. The chat has kind of uh, popped off. Uh, thank the sleuths uh, that uh, no, that, that, you, that you have been writing novels and not telling anyone. <laughs> um, how, how, did, writing... how did none of us know? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know I, how. I don't know how no one knew. How did no one knew when you spoke to the George uh, the George Mason newspaper about it one year? And yes, we found oh the my article. God. <laughs> How, uh, it's all of your secrets. What secrets do you hold, <laughs> Death Lorist? Oh my god. Um, I don't remember giving that interview. <laughs> it's there. It's there. Um, <laughs> it comes up when we Google you. I should probably Google myself at some point in time. And I am surprised Hell that yeah. I have it. Um, Beautiful. I have no memory of that interview. All right. Uh, hey, I got a couple of questions about uh, about uh, rural Virginia where you grew up and still live. Um, question number one: Why is Winchester, Virginia, so buck wild about apples? Because we're the apple capital. I thought that was Washington State. Yeah, we're the apple capital. Oh, we're the, you're the first. <laughs> you're the first apple capital. All right. They were colonized first, as bad as that just sounded. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, yeah, so apples are the staple crop since uh, the area has been settled. Um, and it's still one of the staple crops in the area. There's lots of generational orchardists that have been here since the area was settled. Um, yeah. So we got everything to do with apples. We have apple butter. We have an apple blossom festival. It's like our version of Mardi Gras. Oh, wow. Uh, TBH, everybody wears pink and green tie-dye usually. Um, and floods like the Winchester downtown mall. We have apples just everywhere. We have these like huge ceramic apples that are painted um, by an artist, like scattered across the city. So like, our hospital there's like a big red one that's like wearing a huge steth like stethoscope we have another one that's like painted with historical figures they're just scattered all over the place um very proud of our our apple heritage here um apple picking is like there's like a lot of agro tourism right now mm. um with apples so like we have like your fall like things that people always do is like apple picking and go and you buy the cider and like maybe there's like apple butter demonstrations which is like really cool because normally um i'm gonna like not use the right terminology but this is like how i view it as somebody who's not an orchardist like there's like a huge bat that looks like a cauldron mm. and a very long stick with a end that like is like huge um Looks very scythe like, uh, so you have to like go back and forth stirring it, like, and you walk around the pot oh, just wow. stirring it, um, taking turns, um, because like you have to like melt down the apples, and it's a super long process, and people make a day out of it, um, and then have like our our now like kind of. So like a lot, like some generational orchardists are like kind of capitalizing on the whole like craft beverage movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of that is like cider is like super popular with Horatio people. Horatio pastry is is needing some cider lore. Yeah, mm -hmm. hit it with the cider lore. <laughs> um. So yeah, I can hit you with some cider lore and some cider history. Um. So, like, cider was a super, like, popular beverage back in the day um, when it was settled because, like, it was safer to drink than water. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of like fell out of popularity due to various reasons that other people like uh, Maria Kennedy Maria can speak Kennedy. to better than me. Um, she is like cider lorist, the true possible cider lorist. Um, so there are other people. Yeah. She does rule. Um, but like cider eventually like kind of fell out of popularity um, and wasn't an everyday beverage um, anymore. And then um, it had, like a lot of other things like affecting like the Apple industry because um, the Apple industry was kind of like struggling after uh, globalization became like a huge thing. Um, and then there's like pest control issues that like kind of ruined like the growing ground. Like there was this chemical LR and the government had to buy like so many apples that like were not edible. Mm-hmm. Um, just like help the farms. Um, but a lot of like a lot of like generational orchardists were um, struggling holding on to like their generational land that has been in their gener- like family for many many years and our area you know some of that land has been bought up by developers because of our close proximity to the dc area and by mm. close proximity i mean about an hour and a half away because people make that commute yeah <laughs> um, um but uh, i guess like the coolest thing that, like has been happening is that there's been kind of like an agro dynamism happening with the whole grafting of the apples because okay. like in order for um, um, like to appeal to the people that want like artisanal ciders, uh, they like can't be using things like common like like apples that you see in the grocery store. So like Red Delicious, Honeycrisp, that type deal. Yeah, so a lot of uh, cideries and um that are doing the cidery stuff are trying to like graph a new types of apples and like a like mad scientist kind of way to like achieve that artisanal status um which back before like industrialized food systems like that was a, that was common practice like yeah you had apple chips but people were like grafting new new species of apples like all the time and that was a common practice but with industrialized food systems you're like growing apples that are going to be sold in the grocery stores. And those are things like your red, delicious, yellow, delicious, granny Smith, yada, yada, yada. Um, I didn't expect when, uh, Horatio pastry said, uh, can you give us some cider lore? You were going to come through that well, but damn you, 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 wow. Well, you really are from out there. You know, a ton about cider. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being from the mm-hmm. Apple Capital. Um, Daisy, I got like two questions. Uh, uh, I think two more questions for the activity. Um, do we want to first say, oh, my God, thank you to everyone going nuts in the chat? Yeah, people are going absolutely wild Oh, my God. Right now. Well, I think it's because, A, Caitlin is, ans- is answering uh, amazing Apple questions. They're going nuts for that. But, oh, my God. Yeah, I said we got we got. We got a hype train. We've got, we've got, we've got we've bits. Got some, we've got, we've uh, got uh, some month long subscribers. Some sc- got... Subscriptions being extended into Dang. into the the end of the year. Thank you so much, everyone. Oh my god, yeah. I I love of... I love doing this. This is so much fun. There's and... lots of I- insider puns. Well, I'm not so happy about that. I'm not so happy yeah. about that. But it's like Dom's gonna be upset. Dom's gonna be upset because it's a pun. But yep, I'm fine with that. I love puns. Can we get uh two more questions for you, Caitlin, and then move on to Before your I... uh your activity? Sure. Okay. Uh, number one, what is the secret menu hack uh, at Olive Garden, which only a server would know about? Oh my god, this is a great question. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Are the breadsticks truly unlimited? And why aren't they, why aren't they like feed ending world hunger with breadsticks? 
Um, yes, the breadsticks are unlimited if you purchase an entree. Or uh, one of their, their uh, soup salad soup salad deal. The salad is also like we unlimited if you purchase like an entree. So if like you get an appetizer and you get a salad, you have to pay for the salad. Um, mm. But mm. I mean I guess like my thing is is like you're going to get dessert at Olive Garden. Had I don't know if they still have it on the menu, but it was the best dessert. It was like a lemon cream cake. Like, we always kept, like, raspberry sauce in the back, and it doesn't come with the raspberry sauce, but you should ask for it. Now that's excellent. Now that is excellent. Yeah. Um, As for, like, the other stuff, like, you can sub out most of the sides for anything. I... Not the hugest pasta person, despite working at an Olive Garden. I, I, I get it. You worked at an Olive Garden. I, yeah, yeah, I would expect uh, that. So I would always sub out my pasta side with uh, something else. So I'd get like chicken parm, but like sub out spaghetti for like broccoli. Okay, I mean it's you not heard, like it's not like first folks. My, uh, <laughs> you know what I will say as an, it's, the way my <laughs> Italian family talked about Olive Garden was always like. If we have to go to Olive Garden, we'll go. They have the right oven to make pizza. So it's like, if you go to Olive Garden, like, get, like, you could at least get, like, something baked because they have the, like, you know, <laughs> they're not going to oh. ruin the pizza. The freshest thing that you can get there is the eggplant parm because eggplant does not freeze well. Um, so they. That's what I like to hear. It. I love this kind slice of stuff. It. They slice it fresh. Um, and then they bread it in the back and fry it. So that is the freshest thing that you can get at Olive Garden. All right. You heard it here first. Eggplant parm, <laughs> side of broccoli, lemon cake with the raspberry sauce. That is that oh. is the Olive Garden server order. Has anybody made a folkwise bingo yet? And have you put, uh, when Dom mentions that he's Italian on there? Because that should make uh, be When Daisy face. mentions their mom, has that, has that come up yeah. yet? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hi, Paula, if you're watching. Yet, but... Mom, hope you're out there watching Hi. and listening to Limp Biscuit. I know you'll be <laughs> loving this shit right now. L-I-P- L-I- I can't spell Limp Biscuit. <laughs> All right. Don't, don't do One final question. Bad. One final question. What is the most real housewives experience you have had in all your time as a server? Oh, man. Um, damn, you're going to make me choose. Um, <laughs> not how I thought that was going. You see some wild stuff as a server. And then like, also you get bored as a server. So like you're, you're gossiping about your own tables to other servers, which oh, sure. Too- People betting on the outcomes of what will happen at said table. So I have seen full fledged like screaming breakups <laughs> at um restaurants. Full fledged what? Like screaming breakups. Oh my so God. like one of like my most uncomfortable tables that I ever had was like they got sat. They weren't at like most comfy table but they they were just very clearly not happy to be with one another and the entire time i was like dropping off their food they're just like sniping at one another and then it ended up with the dude like breaking up with her in the form of yelling and walking out oh my god she was just so fuming mad she paid the bill what i remember wasn't the best tip but she why, stormed out after him. Why would it be at that point? Uh, <laughs> um, my most fun, like, real housewives moment was probably, like, my favorite brunch people that would come in. I had no idea what their names were, but they liked me because uh. like, I, they had weird specifications to their drinks, and their drinks got made right every single time. But they would, like, sit there. They would come in at open would sit there they would like just start ordering everything like on the menu all the drinks like 
dude wanted a mimosa, but he wanted to sub out the champagne with tequila. He didn't want it in a flute glass. He wanted it in a tumbler glass, but he also wanted, like, Pacino cherries. Which is, like, essentially just a tequila sunrise without grenadine. <laughs> Oh, I um, kind of love that. Yeah, um, I think we need a float of tequila he with the champagne. Is it cheaper? He ordered order? it as a mimosa. Like... <laughs> oh, it wasn't a cheaper order. Mm. Um, and then uh, they they would make inappropriate jokes the entire time. Mm-hmm. So like, people would be like walking by, and they'd be like side like eye contact like while people were walking by the bar area and be like oh no we left the baby in the car can they you were just like, get your child okay no that's like cue the reality no show child. music there's no kid yeah there was, oh my it's, god it's there gonna was rise no out of Caitlyn they were just and me apparently <laughs> it worked Bobby like so but now I knew that they were joking around they would do it to like get a rise out of like random strangers in the restaurant that were like walking by because like i had them before like a billion mm-hmm. times they did kill well not literally kill like they did upset one of like the other servers in the restaurant when they decided like they wanted to transfer out to the patio and it was like at the end of my shift uh, and they started making those jokes, and he he got very upset. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> Caitlin, are you ready for your tier list? I am. We do a tier list. Omg, I can see the title. So we do a tier list every week on the show with our guest. Uh, you know, we're not ranking just uh, character choice in video games or something like that. This is amazing. We are doing all wow. types of mundane things. And uh, Caitlin, I know you can talk a lot about Real Housewives, and a lot of things have been said about Real Housewives. But we don't want to leave out all of the other shows on the wonderful Bravo Network. Uh, this is so amazing. So we have made a tier list of the trashiest shows on Bravo, and we need you to rank uh, the the Bravo trash TV. Okay. Uh, so uh, the rule was this: the rule on this, no Real Housewives, because that would just devolve into various cities of Real Housewives. The tier list, and they're too good. Also. Uh, no, uh, we try, I think we try to do no competition, so no Project Runway, no, uh, uh, no Top Top Chef, because they're not, they are not trashy enough. So, we've gone for only the trashiest Bravo shows, uh, (laughs) you just want to start, start from, uh, the top, I think they came out in alphabetical order, but we're gonna start, and by the way, by the way, our, uh, sleuths, thank you so much, I had, I have, I've seen, like, one of these shows and had to just react to how they were describing them to me and i'm a little traumatized so <laughs> we're starting off with below deck where is where is below oh deck going my god i below hope deck. my mom's watching this okay below deck is s tier because it's still the only service industry show that they have left now what? that vanderpump rules is no longer service industry based and like what? i'm pretty sure all the rest work is fate wait has there been a plot twist on vanderpump rules no tell me later tell me later okay okay (laughs) next Uh, next just hearing about this show blew my mind uh don't be tardy oh man that's gonna go into like your d tier i can't (laughs) really that low tell me tell me why tell me why like it's a spinoff show from Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yeah. Kim Zolciak used to be a Real Housewife of Atlanta, and um, well, was he, she a housewife or was she the kept woman of Big Daddy? A sentence I still can't fathom. Big uh, Papa. What? Big, Big Papa? Papa. Holy fuck! Okay. <laughs> she was until she like met and married like this like NFL. Yeah, an Atlanta dude. Falcon. Yeah, uh, that she met at a charity thing on Real Housewives. It was, like, really funny that, like, she commented on his Back butt and introduced herself, and next thing you know, she's, like, marrying and having, like, a whole slew of kids. Oh, my God. But, like, Kim Zolciak is a small doses person um, for me. <laughs> like, Real Housewives, sure, not a problem. But to have an entire show dedicated to her, I just can't. Right to I D. Can't. Right to D. 
Um, this show appears to be like, what if the Kardashians were blonde and I don't like it? Um, next up we have yeah. Married to Medicine. Um, I just started Married to Medicine and so one of the people that I follow in the Bravo community says that it is at like S tier and that's yeah. where I'm headed so far. I'm still like only on like the second season of the first first franchise. I haven't started the second franchise yet. But I'll I'll put it S tier after like low S. Below deck. We get a build yeah. S around below deck and married to medicine. Okay, next up is million dollar listing. Uh I'm gonna go ahead and say like See? See? I don't okay. know. I just never really got into it. Yeah. Sure. One of the guys looks like my cousin. Anyway. <laughs> uh, next is Millionaire Matchmaker. Damn. <sighs> You're really trying. Oh. That would also be another, like, C for me. Okay, is Millionaire Matchmaker above Million Dollar Listing in the Battle of the Millions? It's, it's below. It's below. Okay, good to know, good to it's know. It's below. Uh, the only one of these shows I have seen, Shaws of Sunset. Oh, I love Shaws of Sunset. Shaws of Sunset is S tier. Uh, okay, okay, where's it going? Where's it going? It is going to go in between Below Deck and Married to Medicine. Hell yeah, hell yeah. And, w and what makes Shaws of Sunset so, uh, S tier? Um, so, okay. This is going to sound like, as a folklorist, I find it really interesting to have, like, Persian culture highlighted. Oh, sure. On reality TV, and they do speak a lot about their culture. There's a lot of stuff about their traditions. It's really interesting to see, um them talk about their families like immigrating over to the United States as like refugees mm -hmm. um like I, I find the cultural context that they bring to the show to be fascinating um and they do get into some antics uh that are are pretty pretty trashy but like what I like about re trashy reality TV is how it, how sometimes it does provide those like little windows of insight and provide yeah. certain like cultural context that you might not recognize. Like, okay, next one. Okay, so so you were talking about celebrating Shaws of Sunset for its diversity, and now we're moving to the exact opposite. The show that broke me when Carrie was explaining it to me. <gasps> Um, that there are, oh my god, I don't even know if we can get into this on stream, but Southern Charm. Okay, so, Southern Charm is the most problematic show on Bravo, and I can't stop watching it. Oh my god. It is so, so problematic, and, you know, I feel like they really kind of, like, Fill you in with like these terrible like intro songs. Like Southern Charm has the best terrible intro song because it's just like he's got money, he's in magazines. It's super catchy and gets stuck in your head. But that's A. That's A. Okay. Won't put it in S tier. Won't put it in S tier because it is like super super problematic. But um, yeah, it's it, it's A. It's quality. Terrible reality trash TV. Uh, yeah, I tried to. I I I tried to guess the plot when Carrie was telling me about it, and I went as like problematic as as I could possibly imagine. And and Carrie replied with, oh, "What no, would you do if so I told you it was worse?" worse. Yeah. Um. And then uh, next, uh, the, the show that sounds the most fun out of all of these, just hearing the synopses, uh, Summer House. Mm -hmm. I love Summer House. Summer House and S tier. Uh, Where's it going? It. I like how they're they're all goes, like an S tier. <laughs> there's no B. I love that. I really love. Good. I love this valley we're creating. Uh, 
Put it after Shaw's the Sunset. After Shaw's the Sunset, yeah. I heard oh so so yeah. Carrie was telling me the plot of Summer House and I'm like oh I mean like uh I do this every year with my friends it's just not Montauk it's Santa Claus Indiana and that's why I decided mm-hmm. to wear this shirt uh one of my many uh mementos of the cabin my friends and I rent in Santa Claus Indiana every year so we're just like the 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 budget version of Summer House. I'm cool with it. Uh, next off, no uh, uh, another spinoff. Tabitha takes over. Tabitha, it's Tabitha. Are we leaving this one off the list? You don't know Tabitha takes over. No, I don't. Uh, what is she a spinoff from? Be- Chat help. What is she a spinoff from? Why do I feel like she's a medium? She's Australian. Australian. She's like a hairstylist. She does kitchen restaurant, uh, kitchen rescue, but for uh, for salons. Okay, so I have not watched. This okay, show. we can leave that one off the list. We can. It sounds fun. Right. Right. Isn't that what it is? Yeah. Am I just? It's old school Bravo. It's old school Bravo. Okay. 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 So yeah. That, yeah. Okay, so that might be like pre Bravo. I. I'm a fairly like oh well, I guess like can't say recently converted, but I started watching Bravo TV in grad school, like my second year of grad school, because of Vanderpump rules. Uh and that was like back when like people were still servers on that TV show. Sheer genius. Okay, thank you. She's the spin-off mm-hmm. of Sheer Genius. Oh, well, hey, if you're going to bring up of Vanderpump Rules, the last one is Vanderpump Rules. Where's it going? You know, Vanderpump Rules, um, early seasons, fantastic. Mm-hmm. These uh, past few seasons, absolutely terrible. There's enough seasons out there that it's pretty even. So that will be our B, our, our B one. That, okay, that's B. Um, can that's I great. can I ask a question? I still don't know because I've never seen an episode of Vanderpump Rules. Yes. Okay. Rules is that a noun or a verb in that sentence? I think um, that I think it's both. Right. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, a little bit because it's, it's the both. spinoff show of uh, Lisa Vanderpump's, and she was on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and she's like a restaurateur, and um. But she's like the boss, so it's her she rules. The boss. But also, it rules, and yeah. she is the ruler of the rules. And I just assume, you know, with that last name and and rules, she's like mm-hmm. some sort of descendant of William of Orange. That's that's Maybe. what it is in my head. Um, so uh, here is your Bravo trash list on a scale from below deck to, uh, don't be tardy. On a scale from below deck, uh, below deck to don't be tardy. How how well do you treat your blonde people? I don't know. I don't have one this week, guys. Sorry. <laughs> um, Here it is. This is the list. Caitlin, Start Googling. This is the list. This is the list. Screenshot that. Caitlin, we have, uh, speaking of um, old school Bravo, there's uh, one last thing we wanted to do. Okay. If you're cool with that. So, uh, uh, Hold on, hold on. Uh, so, uh, speaking of old school Bravo, we didn't want to leave this. Uh, oh, sorry. On the, on the call. Okay. Speaking of old school Bravo, we uh, we didn't want to leave this without uh, uh, leave this interview and leave that tier list without doing a reference to the all time best Bravo show. So. All right, Caitlin, now it is time for the, the Pivot questionnaire. These 10 questions originally came from a French series, Bouillon de Culture, hosted by Bernard Pivot. They're better known for the questions that James Lipton asked at the end of Inside the Actor's Studio. Uh, all right, I'm going to ask these 10 questions for you. Answer them as uh, fast as you can with any whatever comes to mind. Are you, are you ready? Sure. All right, Caitlin, what is your favorite word? Uh, I don't know. Oh, it's bitch. To be honest, it's bitch. What, is your, what is your least favorite word? Uh, I don't have one that I can think of. 
What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh... <laughs> I don't know. Be nerdy talking shit. <laughs> what turns you off? Uh, people talking over people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what is your favorite curse? <laughs> no, no, no. What is your favorite curse word? Damn, it's bitch again. <laughs> it's bitch again. Uh, what noise or sound do you love? Mm. Why are you making me choose? What noise or sound do you hate? Uh, I'm like the most indecisive person. Why are you doing this? This is me? hysterical. What profession <laughs> other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, I'd be a veterinarian probably. That was that was the alternative track okay. to becoming a folklorist. What profession would you not like to do? Hmm, three twelve teacher. Oh, okay. Awesome. And then uh, my all-time favorite. Caitlin, if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive at the pearly gates? What? So? <laughs> um, all right. Thank you very much to our interview sleuths, Carrie and James Lipton, for helping us Thanks. with this interview. Um, I always, I always like had to make it to the end of that show just so I could hear uh, my favorite question: If heaven exists, what would you want God to say to you when you make it to the pearly gates? I, oh, I loved everyone's answers to that. <laughs> yeah, and it is an appropriate end for Death Lore, to be honest. It is fantastic. I mean, honestly, I'd be like, kind of probably in shock because, like. <laughs> knows what happens after we die uh that's the whole that's the whole dilemma Have had, 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 have had,
making quilts helped, helped me help to, me to, to get, get, get a sense of my own space, my own space. sense of finding my way, my way, sense of really, 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 really